is in this room. I had originally said it was L uh, LT3, but they changed and they're going to put it in here. Um, and I, I, I want to try to do some a little wrap up, um, let you know what happened to all of the people and some of the politics that has followed on to all this. But I will try to keep it fairly brief so we could have some time for questions and discussion. Um, these meetings are supposed to last an hour, um, and I really try hard to do that. I'm not, obviously not very successful. Uh, today, however, there's really a lot of crucial stuff, and, and uh, I want to talk about the Oppenheimer affair and the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, and um, the, how close, how really close we came to the end of the world, much of which people don't really know, and certainly the young people uh, don't know. Anyway, um, so I, I, if I run over a little today, I hope you, you can leave if you have to, but uh, uh, please forgive me. Um, uh, okay, Oppenheimer was a, an extraordinary man. He was enormously intelligent. Remember, I think it was Robbie who said he's the smartest guy I ever met. Um, and he was enormously perceptive about intellectual issues, but he uh, was not very perceptive about human beings and, and personalities. And he, he was quite charming, apparently, to women, but he could be, uh, especially professionally, he could be curt and, and, and fairly brutal. Um, I have seen big people like that in my profession. Um, one of the people who took umbrage to, uh, to, to, um, because of, of Oppenheimer was Louis Strauss. Strauss, of course, had nominated him to be the head of the, um, the, the center in, uh, in Princeton, um, but um, got more and more angry with him. Strauss was not an educated man. He had never gone to university, but he had become very, very wealthy, and that gave him a lot of political power, and he had been in the AEC. But um, Oppenheimer had been very curt with him and had got under his skin, and it rankled and, and grew with time. Um, Strauss, uh, Oppenheimer had, had been removed in the early 50s from his position as head of the General Advisory Committee, and Strauss also had left the AEC in 1951, but in 53, Eisenhower offered him the chairmanship, and he agreed to take it with the proviso that Oppenheimer never be consulted by the AEC. Now, he, he wasn't at the time, and so he was removed from the AEC, but he was still a powerful force in the government. Eisenhower um, referred to him and, and, and um, used him. The State Department, he headed a, a, a committee on, on um, nuclear problems for the State Department. He briefed the National Security Council, which is the prime advisor to the president in the United States. Uh, and, and so he still had uh, considerable uh, power. Um, Strauss wanted to destroy him. And Strauss was, despite being uneducated, he was clever. And, um, you know, they aren't related, these two facts particularly. Uh, and he d derived ways to destroy Oppenheimer. And the way to destroy him, because what was important to Oppenheimer was all these prestigious government things, the way to destroy him was prevent access to that, and the way to do that was to deny his security clearance. And the security clearance was just called Q clearance in those days. Uh, if you could get I, uh, Oppenheimer out of that, he would be... Um, uh, he would be destroyed. Now, at the time, the most powerful man in Washington, not in the world, that was Eisenhower, but in Washington was Joseph McCarthy. And McCarthy he kept holding um, hearings into communists in government, and that was a very, very uh, serious affair. He had huge power. And um, 
he was planning to investigate Oppenheimer, and Strauss thought that was a mistake because he didn't want to make Oppenheimer into a martyr. Uh, and so he got J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, and Richard Nixon, the vice president of the United States, to talk to McCarthy and tell him to back off. Now, to most physicists in the world, Oppenheimer is quite the hero and Teller is quite the, the villain. Um, the atmosphere in the early 60s was one of, of enormous, um, an enormous um, paranoia, virtually, where um, suspicion gave rise to certainties, gave, and certainty gave rise uh, to action. And this happened all the time. A young man I mentioned who had been uh, chief counsel to the Senate, the, the Joint Congressional Committee on Atomic Energy, William Borden, was, had, had gotten in trouble and was removed from chief counsel but kept on the staff. Uh, and so he was still a lawyer working with them. He uh, knew that Strauss... Uh, Straws, I should pronounce his name right, Straws did not like uh, Oppenheimer, and so he appealed to Straws, uh, partly because he wanted a job with the AEC, which he didn't get. But um, Borden then went and talked to a, a fellow counsel named um, John Walker, and he wanted Walker to work with one of the uh, physicist proponents of the hydrogen bomb, John Wheeler at Pr the Princeton Institute, um, to compile a history of the hydrogen bomb development, and in particular of how much Klaus, Klaus Fuchs might know about that. Uh, Fuchs, of course, did not know about the Ulam Teller uh, improvement, which makes the bomb really work. but. Um, so they compiled all this stuff, and it was full of classified material. Despite that, Walker sent it through the regular post from Washington to Princeton. And it came to John Wheeler, who promptly lost it. And it never reappeared, full of secret stuff. And eventually, the empty envelope reappeared in Wheeler's office. Boy, when Eisenhower found that out, he hit the roof. and screamed at the people in the AEC, uh, Borden lost his job, and all kinds of, of important things um, happened. Borden was described as, by the FBI as the most imprudent person they had ever interviewed. Um, now, Borden then wrote a letter to Straws in which he basically sought a job, and, and he repeated all this stuff, including his belief, his firm belief that, I, uh, that uh, Oppenheimer was a Soviet spy. Uh, now, St Straws, um, he also sent the letter to um, J. Edgar Hoover, who had seen all this nonsense before and dismissed it, but he sent the third copy to um, Char Charles Wilson, who was the Secretary of Defense. Now, Wilson had been the head of General Motors and is mostly remembered in the United States for his famous comment that what's good for the General Motors is good for the United States. Um, business above all. Um, now, Wilson, uh, Hoover had dismissed it, but Wilson took it desperately seriously, and he then went to Eisenhower. Now, Eisenhower was quite sympathetic to Oppenheimer, and particularly to Oppenheimer's idea of openness for nuclear, n nuclear secrets, um, because they aren't secret. Physics isn't secret. Um, but Eisenhower had politics to worry about. And as I said, the most significantly important person in Washington was uh, Joe McCarthy. And it didn't take much of a leak from the Joint Committee on, on Atomic Energy to um, McCarthy's Committee on Investigations for McCarthy to get wind of all this, and Roy Cohn, who was even more wicked than, than McCarthy, to, to start investigating. And that was political trouble for Eisenhower. So he agreed to suspend 
Oppenheimer's security clearance, just suspended. So a wall was erected between Oppenheimer. Now, how to do this was difficult, because Hoover had lots of information about Oppenheimer, but uh, he couldn't use most of it because it had been illegally obtained by phone taps and various things, and you weren't allowed to do that. Not that they didn't, but you weren't uh, uh, supposed to. Um, Oppenheimer was in, in London delivering a set of Reith lectures, which are um, the BBC's most uh, prestigious lecture series. Uh, and so he wasn't told that his clearance had been suspended because they thought he would then flee behind the Iron Curtain as, because he was a spy. Um, but Teller was told, and that's, that's nasty. Um, what to do, with, with, with how to, to, to go, go about this investigation because um, all of the, the charges from the 40s, that had been gone through and settled and, and all that file stuff was well known. Plus, you couldn't complain about his advice on the hydrogen bomb because that was advice and you're allowed to have opinions. So what Straws and the AEC lawyers decided to do was that they would compile all of the recommendations that he had made on the hydrogen bomb, look for inconsistencies, and claim that was treason. Um, anyway, that's what they decided to do. Now, in May of 1952, the FBI had uh, interviewed Edward Teller, and he had let his spleen run against Oppenheimer. And he said all sorts of really uh, nasty things, most of which were not true. Uh, in particular, he, he even attacked Oppenheimer's psyche, saying that Oppenheimer wanted to be the world's greatest physicist, and he wasn't, and that made him susceptible to all kinds of lures from the Soviet Union. Uh, all, all basically rubbish. But by going through and looking at these obviously different advice, and you're allowed to change your mind, I would think, but not for the AEC, they found 40 separate charges that they thought they could make against uh, Oppenheimer. Now, when he got from, when Oppenheimer returned from London, uh, and he saw all these charges, and Strauss fished for his resignation. Because the choice he had was to resign or ask for a security hearing. But he wouldn't resign because uh, he, he said that would be some admission that I wasn't capable of doing this job, which I am. Uh, and that was reasonable. And Strauss, in the way that many cowardly people do, made much milder charges against him, as did Teller, when they had to actually face the man. <coughs> Um, Oppenheimer was puzzled because he thought, look, I've, I've given really a lot of service over the period of 12 years, and all these charges should have been laid to rest. It's, this is irrelevant. He could not have been more incorrect. Um, Oppenheimer hired a lawyer, William Lord Garrison, William Lloyd Garrison, who was a very distinguished man, but a little politically naive in this situation because he agreed to be Oppenheimer's lawyer, but he didn't go to the AEC and ask for security clearance. And that was a mistake because sometimes during the hearing he had to leave the room and couldn't be there to defend him. Um, he did eventually ask, but only a couple of weeks before it wasn't enough time, blah, blah, blah. Um, the FBI, he, okay, so he, uh, Oppenheimer had this lawyer. Uh, Oppenheimer would call him on the telephone. They'd have these discussions. The FBI had tapped his telephone and recorded these, which is, of course, completely illegal. I mean, in, at least in the U.S., lawyer-client uh, conversations are privileged and confidential. Um, Straws appointed a committee for the security hearing, the f uh, all of whom, even the AEC commissioners in general, thought were incompetent, uh, the first of whom um, 
was a Democrat in principle who thought that Stevenson, the 1952 candidate for president, was a commie sympathizer and he wouldn't vote for him. Uh, the third man just, uh, just used to claim that, look, every spy we've ever seen is Jewish and Oppenheimer is Jewish, so he must be a spy. <laughs> that, that sort of syllogism uh, doesn't work very well. The physics community, with obvious exception of Teller, rallied strongly to um, Oppenheimer's support. Um, now, back in, in early 1954, which is this time, um, the US initiated the development of a whole new design of thermonuclear weapons. Um, they had run the Ivy Mike series that we talked about, uh, and that was this huge undeliverable bomb made with liquid deuterium. And I forgot to bring this device yesterday, but I remembered today. Uh, this is a dewer, which, which is the kind of thing you use to store uh, liquids of extremely cold temperature. This is basically a, a much improved version of the thermos bottle. And this is used for liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is easy to make. It's a mere 196 degrees below zero to get to its boiling point. It's easy, and so this doesn't even have a top, and it sort of sits and boils. And I didn't bring any, although you can see lots of demonstrations in which you, know, you pour this stuff out and it does funny things. But um, liquid deuterium is 250 degrees below zero, and that's precious stuff. Liquid nitrogen is everywhere around. Um, and so those are very fancy doers with tops and so forth. Uh, but now that they knew that this system would work, they wanted to make solid um, thermonuclear bombs, not liquid ones, and things that would be smaller and therefore deliverable by airplane. Now, in the Ivy Mike test, they used the fusion of, of deuteron on deuteron. Remember, um, deuterium is an isotope of, of hydrogen. But if we take away the electrons, we just get the nucleus. We don't call it deuterium. We call it a deuteron. And tritium is called a triton. It's got two neutrons. And it's an unstable radioactive nucleus. Um, the reaction in Ivy Mike was one deuteron on another deuteron fusing. Because they were so hot, they could get close. And that process is a million times more probable than proton on proton. And a deuteron on a triton is a thousand times more probable than DD reaction. So the idea is to get tritium. But tritium is rare and radioactive, so clever. Uh, uh, we'll make tritium in the bomb itself a formula, that leads me to. Um, if you have an isotope of lithium called lithium-6, it has three protons, that makes it lithium, and it has three neutrons, six particles. If you strike it with a neutron, and there are huge numbers of neutrons from the um, fission bomb, you, you split it up and you get one neutron and two neutrons and two protons and a tritium nucleus. And so you make it. Once the fission bomb goes on, it hits lithium-6, and you make it. And then the deuteron and the triton fuse, and they make ordinary helium and a free neutron and a huge amount of energy. Huge energy. Okay. So, um, such a bomb was built. It's a little bit of a problem because when you get, tritium is an incredible uh, metal. Uh, it's very useful. Batteries are made out of lithium hydride and this device would not exist were it not for lithium. So I think every one of us in this room carries one and these devices depend absolutely on lithium. So it's a very versatile and useful metal. But when you dig it out of the ground, 
it is consists of two isotopes, 97 94% of which is lithium-7, containing um, four neutrons, and only 6% is lithium-6. And you need to get that out. So you need to separate two isotopes. But that's the whole purpose of what the US did at, at Oak Ridge to separate out uranium isotopes. So they sure as hell knew how to do that. And so they prepared this thing which we saw yesterday in the film, an explosion called Castle Bravo. Uh, and that was to be set off at the Bikini uh, at Atoll because any we talk had been de decimated by the, the um, Ivy Mike test. Um, so they had enriched the lithium from about 6% to 40% lithium-6. The bomb was designed to be somewhere between five and seven megatons, and they set it off, <clears throat> and it was much more powerful. It was 15 megatons, as they mentioned in the film yesterday, and it was 15 megatons because there was a reaction in there that they did not understand in, in advance. And that is that when you have lithium-7, which was still 60% 60, 60 of the lithium, and it is struck by a neutron, it makes helium again, but it, this is a triton, I didn't use T, I used H for some stupid reason, but this is the thing you want, and it get, this also gives energy. So the thing gave double the energy that they had planned, and that was very serious for several reasons. First of all, the bomb was too big. Secondly, uh, they had put it in bikini on the northernmost island because, again, they wanted the wind to blow the, the fallout over the ocean. But just b as the test went off, the wind shifted dramatically to the east and blew the fallout to the east. Now, to the east, were all the ships and servicemen and everybody who had been taken off bikini, thousands and thousands of, of young men and women who were on board ship 25 to 50 kilometers away, and they were all drenched with radioactive fallout. Even at 50 kilometers, they were exposed to something like having 10 to 20 x-rays right away. So a very significant dose uh, of radiation, most unpleasant. This thing made a crater over one and a half kilometers wide and over 60 meters deep. Uh, within a minute, the fireball uh, had reached um, an altitude of 15 kilometers. Remember, when we fly, that's 10 or 11 kilometers. It had reached 15 kilometers, the stem of which was 600 meters across. Within 10 minutes, the cloud was 45 kilometers wide and had reached an altitude of 34 kilometers, which is above the, the stratosphere into what's the layer called the troposphere. Eventually, it wound up at 100 kilometers wide. I'm sorry, 100 miles, 140, 160 kilometers. That's enormous. So it was the biggest bombs ever, ma ever made by the US. The Soviets made bigger. And here's what it would do to a city the size of Chicago, where I used to live. Okay, that's the effect of a Nagasaki bomb. That's the effect of the Bravo bomb. All the people in these circles would be dead, by the way, instantly. Now, since I live in London, I found a similar picture for London. In this gray circle, which comprises every single borough in London and most of the suburbs, every human being would be dead. In this circle, which reaches to Reading, every human being would have suffered a minimum of third degree burns and most would have died. It's just, just staggering what these things do. Now, the worst part of, of this thing uh, when it went off 
was that there was a 160 kilometer radius exclusion zone uh, that was patrolled. There was a Japanese fishing boat called the Fukuryu Maru, Maru uh, which was just outside fishing. But because the bomb was twice as big, they were uh, again uh, covered by radioactive fallout. When they got back to Japan 10 days later, every single one of the 23 crewmen had serious radiation poisoning. Japanese had been irradiated by Americans yet again. Japan erupted in, in fury. It was made even worse when one of, the, one of the sailors actually died. It was an extraordinarily bad thing to do. Uh, Strauss, Strauss uh, claimed the testing was never out of control. Uh, he claimed that the fishing boat had been well within the exclusion zone which is completely untrue, and I had the feeling they may have intimated that in the film yesterday, which is, is really wrong. Um, and uh, he suggested that it wasn't a fishing boat at all, but rather a Russian spy ship. So that um, lies like that in Washington do not seem to be the, the prerogative of the current um, occupant of the White House. Um, Oppenheimer, of course, had lost the security clearance, so he did not know the results of the test, although he knew it was taking place. So he called the friend and said, could I at least have a number? And the friend said, you know, the friend thought, I, this is a man I've known for 20 years. Uh, how can I deny him? And he just said, 15. And of course, Oppenheimer knew what that meant, and that number was staggering. In April, um, in, in April the 12th, uh, 1954, the Oppenheimer security uh, hearings started. And these were meant to be a hearing and not a trial. It was not a legal proceeding as such, but it turned into a truly dreadful witch hunt. The first two days were direct examination of Oppenheimer by William Lloyd Garrison and lots of support supporting witnesses. Um, physicists both within and without uh, Los Alamos uh, spoke strongly on his behalf. Uh, and, they, and Los Alamos physicists had it tried to intercede with Strauss uh, at the AEC to prevent the hearing in, uh, entirely. The AEC had chosen a, a very good lawyer themselves named Roger Rab, uh, Rob, and now it became his turn to uh, cross-examine uh, uh, Oppenheimer. And uh, he had read all the security stuff that had been available on the man and had concluded that he was either a dupe or a, 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 a direct communist. Um, none of Oppenheimer's lawyers were allowed to see any of the FBI files. But, of course, the AEC people uh, were, uh, were. Now, Oppenheimer had been interviewed by the FBI twice, once in 1943, once again in 1946. Uh, so that was 11 years ago and eight years ago, and those numbers matter. Um, Teller, of course, you remember in, back in 52 had been interviewed uh, by the FBI and that interview was to prove absolutely crucial in, in, uh, as was Teller himself in all of this stuff. Now, when he had been interviewed in 43, he, he basically said the truth but he shaded it. When he had been interviewed again in 46, he had lied to We'll come to maybe why he had lied in a bit. But he lied and he knew he lied, of course. Um, and those two testimonies were in, in contradiction to one another. Okay? So the first thing uh, he was asked about was the, 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 um, by, by um, Rob was uh, the contradiction between what he said in 43 and 46, what he did not know 
was that secretly the FBI had recorded these conversations, so Rob had all this information verbatim, whereas Oppenheimer had to refer to memories from something that was 11 years ago. And it, I mean, my memory 11 years ago is not very good. Uh, so it was not a terribly fair uh, comparison. And he was asked about the contradiction. And he was in trouble immediately because he could say, well, look, the 46 stuff was true, but the 43 stuff was a lie. Now, to lie to the FBI is a criminal offense. And he could be indicted for that. But 1943 was outside the statute of limitations, so it wouldn't matter. But what he said in 43 was basically true. What he said in 46 was basically false. So he had to lie yet again and say 46 was true in 43. And he, so he was trapped. He was just trapped, because then he would be lying to Rob. And he was stuck, trapped, and he knew it. And Rob destroyed him. He turned absolutely ghostly pale, wrung his hands, and collapsed. It was just, just dreadful. Uh, um, why did he lie? Well, why did he lie? Um, first of all, he, he talked about Hocon Chevalier, who was a friend, and people thought. But 20 years later, it turned out that not only Chevalier had been involved, and, and talked of and ever, but his brother Frank, who is also a physicist, and Frank had been a member of the party between 37 and 39, and, Fra and um, it's very likely that Oppenheimer was trying to protect his brother. Okay. Um, now, because of the communist paranoia that was going on at the time, in 1947, Frank's a membership of the party was discovered and he was immediately sacked. And he didn't have a job for 10 years. In 1957, uh, McCarthy had already been disgraced and um, the situation had changed somewhat. Uh, and so uh, he was allowed to, to go back and teach in high school physics and eventually hired by the University of Colorado. Um, he had become, Frank had become in this time, terribly interested in the science education. And so he uh, applied for and won a very significant <coughs> amount of money from the US National <coughs> Science Foundation, which he used to open a science museum in San Francisco called the Exploratorium, which is one of, the, if not the best science museum in the world. So he has contributed a great deal. Now. Had the hearing stopped at this point, it would have been OK, because all of this was known, and it was horribly embarrassing and not known to the public, but it was out there. But Straws and was out to destroy him. And so what they started was to um, talk about uh, the, the, the contradictions in what he had talked about in terms of the um, hydrogen bomb. Uh, what had started as a hearing was quickly turning into a trial. And what really mattered, what really counted and, and moved the pendulum was the testimony of Edward Teller. Teller was quoted as saying that it was necessary to, dis to unfrock Oppenheimer. Otherwise, there'd be no enthusiasm for building world-ending bombs. Um, remember, Teller had been interviewed a few years before by the FBI, and he had made uh, all these really scurrilous um, charges against Oppenheimer, most of which were not true. Um, and in his testimony, he told what truly were direct lies, that he claimed Oppenheimer had delayed the production of the hydrogen bomb by years and years, because had they started in 1946 instead of in 1950, 
by 1951, they would have had significant weapons and they would have been way ahead and much safer. That was untrue because you could not make a hydrogen bomb until the Teller Ulam um, invention about radiation implosion was discovered and that was in 1950. It was a direct lie. Um, not a good thing to do. Uh, also, Teller um, was virulently anti-communist and he thought that Oppenheimer was very soft on communism, which wasn't completely true. Uh, Oppenheimer was very opposed to the Soviet uh, Soviet uh, communism, and here's a quote from the Reith lectures that he had given in 53. Um, a, all truth is one truth, all experience is compatible, total knowledge is possible, etc. Um, the man who is my intellectual hero in the world, um, Isaiah Berlin, uh, has talked about the um, the conflicting truths that exist in the world. And his book, Two Concepts of Liberty, is one of the great um, works of the 20th century. Um, Teller testified in Oppenheimer's presence, uh, and that caused him to back off some of the more virulent things. But he was a very clever man, and um, he testified that Oppenheimer was loyal to the U.S., but, and that but was important. In a great number of cases, I have seen he acts in a way which is hard to understand. I would prefer to see the, the security in other hands, which I understand better and trust personally feel more secure now this is what I said before he claimed that Oppenheimer had delayed it uh, which is completely untrue Yeah, this is from the FBI's um, interview of Teller. He'd do almost anything to see Oppenheimer separated from the general advisory, poor advice and policies, and delaying of the development of the hydrogen bomb. All rubbish. Uh, this is a statement by I.I. Robbie in support of Oppenheimer. Um, he was forgiven the atomic bomb. He was really a man of peace, and they destroyed him. That should be a lowercase a. Um, yeah, he didn't pay enough attention to say he was a very uh, an intellectual aesthetic person of the upper middle classes. He was a wealthy man, of course. This Oppenheimer family in New York, uh, from Germany and New York, I was told, are second cousins to the South African Oppenheimers. So there is a relationship. Um, all of T Teller's testimony was mean and aggressive and, and truly unnecessary. Um, he testified that if the, with regard to intent, Oppenheimer should be granted clearance, but with regard to wisdom and judgment, he should be denied clearance. And, you know, Oppenheimer was a consultant. If you don't want to consult a consultant, you don't consult them. You didn't need to. You didn't need to destroy the man. And that's what Strauss and Teller wanted to do, and they succeeded. Oppenheimer was truly devastated, and his spirit was broken. Running the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton was a bagatelle for him, easy. What mattered to the man was his security clearance and his 
interactions with government. It made him feel important and, and needed and useful. And that was gone. Um, he might perhaps have a little bit of satisfaction five years later because Louis Strauss was also destroyed. Strauss uh, had finished his term as chairman of the AEC uh, and Eisenhower wanted to nominate him to be Secretary of Commerce in his cabinet. Cabinet positions in the United States require confirmation by the U.S. Senate. And so hearings were held, and uh, in his responses to the questions, which lasted two whole weeks, um, Strauss lied, and he was blasted by the senators for his arrogance and his um, um, his rigidity, and the Senate voted 46 to 49 to deny him um, his, his position, and he was devastated and never recovered. Oppenheimer, on the other hand, was lauded throughout the world, and um, and uh, was um, awarded the Fermi Medal, which was the highest award possible from the AEC, which had denied, still denied him security clearance, but gave him the, its highest award, which consisted of a medal and $50,000. That was scheduled to be delivered in uh, the 2nd of December in 1963 by John Kennedy, who had been murdered two weeks before, so it was a very quiet ceremony in the White House uh, given by Lyndon Johnson. Teller uh, sought some kind of reconciliation with Oppenheimer, but that, I mean, too much, too much water under the bridge. Teller became as, about as popular with his physics colleagues as Richard Nixon became with politicians after Watergate, uh, which wasn't very popular. Oh, well, I can leave that up for the time. Um, Most uh, physicists were very angry at Teller, uh, and particularly the ones at Los Alamos who knew the most and knew it was Teller's insistence on a megaton bomb that caused the delay, because they could have um, they could have built the alarm clock. The alarm clock was up to, you remember, Nagasaki was 20,000 tons of dynamite. The alarm clock was a half a million. So it was a big thing. Teller wouldn't build one because he wanted a megaton bomb. That was what the delay was. Had he done that, by 1949, the Americans would have had 500, uh, 500 kiloton bombs. They would have been, at the time the Soviets tested their first little one, little one, and uh, the, the Americans would have been well ahead. Then they could have done the Teller Olam uh, invention and made really big bombs, and they would have been well ahead, and all of this venom and nastiness would have been avoided. So the Los Alamos people who knew this really blamed Teller. Teller wanted the biggest possible bomb. This is a cartoon by William Malden, Malden was a very famous cartoonist in the 50s and 40s and 50s. Uh, the most famous cartoon which I remember was of Abraham Lincoln after the assassination of Kennedy. Um, there's a, a Lincoln Memorial in Washington which has a very dignified statue of Lincoln sitting there. And in Malden's cartoon, that statue is going like this. It was a very powerful statement. Um, now, throughout the years of the Korean War, Le Curtis LeMay, who was head of SAC, had turned the Strategic Air Command into a weapon which could destroy any nation in the world in a single night. Um, deterrence was the formal strategy of the world, uh, and uh, SAC had priority in the defense budget, and the number of Soviet targets available drove the number of bombs made. It was just sort of backward. Uh, in 1945, the, U the Air Force had identified 66 targets. 
But by 1952, that number had become 6,000. Cities, nuclear production facilities, factories, military bases, um, reservoirs, everything. Um, by 1955, the U.S. was spending more on nuclear weapons development than the entire investment of General Motors, U.S. Steel, Bethlehem Steel, um, Alcoa Aluminium Country, DuPont Chemical Country, all put together more on weapons. They were spending something of the order of $8 billion. Is that right? $9 billion, which is about equivalent in today's money close to $80 billion, just on atomic weapons. Um, not just bombs, but other things like artillery shells, such as those who saw the film yesterday saw actually one going off, and depth charges for submarines, and hand grenades, with, and, and all sorts of incredible things. In 1950, they had 298 bombs. In 1955, they had 2,400. In 1961, 18,600. And at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, just a few years later, 27,100 individual bombs. The SAC Air Fleet had 700 nuclear-carrying bombers and 1,000 refueling planes. LeMay always said he preferred offense to defense because a bomber will always get through. And those of us old enough to remember the film Dr. Strangelove will know that that was true. Um, one bomb, bomber did get through and the world ended. There were very serious discussions in the United States in the 1950s uh, about preventative war. Um, I, I want to make sure I get to the Cuban Missile Crisis, so I'm looking to see what I can skip. Um, the um, The Air Force really had a, a really recommended that the U.S. that the U.S. precipitate a war. This was in 1954. Eisenhower said that's absolutely nonsense, and he vetoed that. Uh, Matthew Ridgway, who is the Army Chief of Staff, um, also said it's just abhorrent, abhorrent. LeMay was a power unto himself. Um, by 1954, he began secret negotiations, secret operations. Um, bomber crews needed information about the Soviet Union. They needed radar maps. They needed to know where targets were, particularly. Uh, by, in 1950, a US plane flying over the Soviet Union had been shot down. and. Um, so Truman had banned overflights, which are an act of war, by the way. Um, but LeMay wanted them, and so he made a secret deal with the British. He, he and the Air Force gave the British the best jet bomber that the Americans had, which was the B-45 at the time. And um, in return, the RAF conducted overflights, which were approved by Winston Churchill when he became um, Prime Minister again in 1952. Um, by 54, the U.S. was overflying uh, the Soviet Union, independent of what um, Truman had, had said. Um, eventually, as many of us will remember, um, in 1960, a U-2 spy plane was shot down uh, over the Soviet Union. It was, fa in fact, over the Soviet Urals, uh, trying to photograph the Mayak um, area and the Schnezinsk la Laboratory, which was the Soviet's second um, nuclear weapons lab and equivalent 
uh, or to the um, um, U.S.'s Livermore Labs. Um, speaks for itself. The Soviets had no way of knowing what these planes were, of course. For all, I mean, they carried cameras, but they could have carried nuclear weapons. They didn't know. Had the Soviets overflown the U.S. like that, the U.S. would have wiped, SAC would have wiped out the Soviet Union. But in the 50s, of course, Soviet capability was in approving. And back in 1953, Oppenheimer made the following statement. I like this, this is a famous quote, two scorpions in a bottle, each capable of killing the other, but only at the risk of its own life. Um, in the 80s, Gorba Mikhail Gorbachev made a similar statement. He said that when, it, when threatened, the weaker power can set off its arsenal, even if it does it on its own territory because that would be suicide for it immediately, but a long, slow, painful death for the enemy. For LeMay, deterrence was an intolerable situation because it made SAC more or less I irrelevant. Um, In 1957, this was LeMay's comment. I don't care, it's my policy, it's what I'm going to do. And he had control of the nuclear weapons, and even in the 60s, when they had security features called permissive action locks or POWs, and that's on the, your little handout that I gave you what they are. Uh, he had the codes to set those off. The codes today are only accessible to one person in the world, the person who has the football, and that's the President of the United States, has the codes which unlock all those things. That's an untenable situation in my opinion. Okay, now the Cuban Missile Crisis, finally. Um, the, the revolution of 1959 brought a communist government within 90 miles of the United States. Um, John Kennedy had succeeded Eisenhower as um, President of the United States in, 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 in January of 61. Um, and there had been all the, uh, this um, discussion uh, during the 1960 presidential campaign, which I can remember, about um, the uh, missile gap that the Soviets were ahead, which is utter nonsense because by 1961 there were no more U-2 flights. Gary Powers would have been the last one anyway uh, because there were spy satellites and the U.S. knew that it had close to 10 times the capability of the Soviet Union. However, <coughs> uh, yeah, the Soviets had 44 ICBMs, 155 heavy bombers. The U.S. had 156 ICBMs, 1,300 heavy bombers, and 144 Polaris submarines. Um, now, one of the things Kennedy did immediately was put SAC on a 15-minute alert, which meant that there would be 12 B-52 B bombers, the biggest airplane ever made, that were in the air all the time, all carrying a minimum of four nuclear weapons. Uh, 
Also, what Kennedy did, which was unknown to the American public at the time, is he agreed with Turkey to store 15 Jupiter missiles on the northern coast of Turkey. These are intermediate range nuclear, nuclear tip missiles, um, which had a 2,400 kilometer range, putting all of the major Soviet cities within range of them. This was kept secret from the Americans, well known to Nikita Khrushchev. Um, 